yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap. Alright, listen. Alright, today the, is a sort of the last the last part of the discussion we've been having for the last three lectures about or last two or three lectures about you know, optimizing scans and optimizing data system using vectorization and compilation. So today is really now a comparison of the two approaches, summarizing what we've learned, and, and then evaluating under what conditions is one approach better than another. Again, so this is, again, the, this is just the, the agenda for you guys in the class. Again, project one is due uh, this Sunday coming up. Chi has the fastest. Good luck being that. Um, and he, we can discuss what, what makes him so good afterwards, among other things. Uh, Project two will be, because uh, I'll talk about the end of this class, that'll be due April 30th um, or May 1st. There's a check-in uh, on April 1st. And then uh, project three, again, we'll also discuss today. The proposals will be in class Wednesday here. Uh, that'll be just a five-minute presentation with your team. And then we'll do an update later in the semester. And then the final presentation will be whenever we, we announce the, whenever we have the final exam date. So instead of having a real final exam, there, there's a final exam that's take home, that's written. But then in class, we'll do, uh, We'll do team, final team presentations. We'll get pizza and do whatever. And if you guys want to do something fun afterwards, we, we can go do that. Like last year, we what? We shot bows and arrows. Right? We, we, we can go go-karting, whatever you guys want. OK? All right, any questions about project one, two, or three? All right, all right, mostly about project one. OK. So uh, again, just to summarize what we've learned in the last uh, two weeks, vectorization can speed up your database. Compilation can speed up your database, right? Like the, the, we've shown and we've read papers that discuss that all the better performance you're going to get because because of these things are you know you're you're processing batches of tuples to amortize costs in the vectorization case. You're taking advantage of of new instructions that's that's in the hardware, and the, and the compilation we are basically hard coding a program that ex executes exactly what your query wants. Um, but, but We've looked at them, and mostly in isolation. I've alluded a little bit that the literature seems to suggest, and certainly this paper you guys read talks, about, talks into these terms, um, that, the, that these two are mutually exclusive. Like if you have a vectorized system, it can't be compilation. If you're doing compilation, you can't do vectorization. That's not true, but it's still worth looking at the two approaches uh, in isolation of each other to figure out like, you know, when is one better than another, and what are the pros and cons of, of each of them. Right? And so the paper is a... Is a, is, is, a, is a micro benchmark uh, sort of study or evaluation within a single system where the, we're going to avoid all the high level overhead or all additional overhead or other complications of a real full fed system that may affect performance. And we'll cover what those are as we go along. Like, strip all that out, run on the same system that supports both compilation and vectorization. And then you can have a true apples to apples comparison of, of the two approaches. All right? And the reason why we want to do this is because building a database system is hard, and going back after it's already written and trying to add compilation or trying to add vectorization is, is basically almost impossible, right? Because it would be a, be a major engineering effort to go retrofit these things ba back in. Now, Postgres added predicate compilation with, with LLVM, but they only do it for, uh, again, they only do it for the where clauses. They don't do the holistic compilation that Hyper does. Doing holistic compilation the way Hyper does, to add that back in a whole system is basically almost like rewriting it from scratch. Vectorization is probably a little bit easier to add, but still it's not trivial. So we, ideally, we want, if we're going to build a new system, we would understand the, the trade-offs of these two approaches. And you know, based on what our use case or target application domain is, we can make a decision at the beginning as we build a system which one we should use. Right? And that's, that's sort of what the goal of this, this paper was. So before we get into, again, the, 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 the microbenchmarks, let's just refresh our memory of what these two different approaches are, uh, we're talking about. Right, so it's, the paper sort of breaks it up into the, the sort of vectorized camp and then the, the hyper camp. So recall from last class uh, that I said the way vectorized worked, it wasn't doing compilation on the fly this way the hyper does, but instead they, would, they had these pre-compiled primitives, or these essentially functions, that would implement some operation or small operation in the database system. Like, like, take a column of integers and compare whether a value is greater than, least, less than, equal to, or so forth. And each of those, like for each of those operands, less than, greater than, so forth, that's a separate primitive function that gets compiled. And then when the, uh, when the query shows up, the, uh, you generate the physical plan, 
And that physical planet is basically going to be an interpreted, uh, or it would then be interpreted by the database system. But instead of having these like switch statements to say, you know, if I'm, I, my column type is this and, and I want to do this operand, traverse the expression tree and, and evaluate it, instead I just, I just maintain the, the, the pointer to the function that does whatever the primitive I, want, I, mean, I need, and then I invoke that primitive to operate on batches of tuples. And normally that would be super expensive if you, if you were doing this on a, on a per tuple basis. Like if you're like in, a, in a Postgres system, uh, in a system like Postgres, for every single tuple, you've got to make a function called to see whether one, one, one value is less than another value, which is what Postgres does. That's going to be super slow. And so the way Vectorize is going to avoid this overhead or amortize the cost is by operating on batches of tuples or vectors of tuples. Again, hence the name Vectorize, right? So the, and then the output of these primitives are going to be the offsets of the tuple that satisfy a predicate, similar to that, the, the bit mask stuff that we talked about before. And then they can use that to feed into the, to the next primitive if it's a conjunction or if it's multiple predicates and use that to then to say, you know, only evaluate whatever it is the, for that primitive on these matching tuples, right? So again, also be clear too, these, these primitives, again, they're, they're written by the developers. I forget whether they're autogen or not, but they're written by the developers and they're compiled when you compile the database system. And then they're, they're, they're shipped in the binary of the database system. It's not like a shared object that's getting linked in dynamically on the fly. Like the, the system comes, you know, pre-compiled pre, pre with all these things. So let's look at a really simple query, select star from foo. We have a string column equals some, some, some ABC string or constant. And then integer column equals something, right? So it's a simple query plan, a scan with, with a predicate, a filter. So the filter we've broken up on, on the conjunction. So you'd have one primitive that takes a, that takes a uh, column of, of integers, or, sorry, column of strings from the table, and then the constant you want to compare against ABC, and then you're just going to you know, scan through it, the, 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 the batch, uh, that evaluate the predicate, and then add it to, if it, if it just matches, then append its offset into some vector. And then you take the output of this, and then use that to invoke in, in, uh, in the next primitive, where you now scan on the second column, on the, on the integer column, and, and apply that predicate, and return that back. So for this, this is, this is not the actual code you would want to use. This is, this is an approximation. You wouldn't obviously want to allocate memory for, these, for the offsets you know, within the function to return that. Like you, all these things are these fixed length buffers that you can, you can uh, pre-allocate and reuse over and over again right? to, to make things go fast. And then we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later on, but like we'll compare, the, in, the, in the paper, we'll, they'll study whether how easy it is for like the compiler to vectorize this or whether we have to write things uh, using intrinsics. For these two examples, I mean, at least for integer, this is super easy, right? The compiler had no problem with it. String's a little bit more complicated in terms of how you encode them and so forth. All right, the other approach is with Hyper doing the holistic query compilation. Again, they called it the, the push-based model, the data-centric uh, approach, operator fusion. We've, it's the bottom-up approach where you have these sort of for loops and the idea is that for each, uh, each iteration in that for loop, it corresponds to one tuple in, in the pipeline. You do as much work as you can on that tuple up the pipeline until you reach the pipeline breaker, then go back and get the next tuple. Right? But they're trying to compile all the, you, you basically you compile all the query. Like not just like have these function pointers, like you bake in everything all, all into this, uh, this like single function and then you invoke that. And the goal for them is that they're going to try to uh, keep a tuple for as long in, in CPU registers or L1 cache for as long as possible up the pipeline. Um, and because that's going to reduce the you know, number of cache misses uh, and potentially increase the instructions per cycle as you go up. Again, this approach is not going to be vectorizable. The, the relaxed operator fusion paper that I talked about before from my one student that does sort of combine this with, ve with vector, vector wise that you can combine the both, but for this paper in particular, they're not doing any vectorization. And I think the paper you guys, the, the paper you guys had on compilation, they were doing, they were doing uh, uh, vectorize hyper. All right, so again, going back to the same query here, now instead of having uh, multiple primitives, just think you have a single, uh, single function that's going to scan the table to produce this query, uh, where you're passing in, say, you know, the, maybe the pointers to the columns, uh, and you're just going to evaluate, uh, you know, evaluate the predicate first and uh, evaluate the two predicates together, and then if it matches, put it in the, uh, put it in the output buffer. And again, I'm showing, showing the branched version of this. I think they'll use branchless as well. They'll compare that, but we can ignore that for now. 
All right, so for today's class, again, now we do a, the, you examine this, this, this uh, the two approaches, you know, see what works, and see when one is better than another. Um, and then we'll, because I, I, I welched on this last week, we'll, or last class, we'll do project two and project three and g give you guys an overview of what's, what's expected, okay? All right, so as I said, for this, for this paper here, the goal was to have a single system that implemented both of these approaches so that we can evaluate them in sort of in a, in, a, in a single architecture to understand when is one going to be better than another. The reason why you have to have a single system is because when you look at some of the, the papers that compares you know, hyper versus vectorwise or even our old system Peloton, the, the analysis of the results would be like, would always say things like, yes, hyper is faster, but that's because they do numerics very, very efficiently. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this for project three. Like they're, they do numerics in a way that's way more efficient than what Postgres does or other, most systems do. Um, or like in other cases, vector-wise will be faster because the way they do multi-threading. So we want to avoid all of that additional, uh, uh, additional features and functionality, strip that all away and get it down to be a single system so we, we have you know, a straight comparison of these two approaches. Um, Another example would be like in Hyper, they're using the morsels approach with threading to decide how to schedule, uh, schedule tasks or queries. Whereas in Vectorwise, they're, they're spawning threads and letting the OS schedule things, right? So we want to avoid all, all of that. So now, all the high-level algorithms will be the same in both implementations, but the low-level details will be slightly different because there'll be certain des design decisions you would make that are going to be more efficient versus one versus another that you can't use, you can't be the same thing. So the example would be the, 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 how they do hash joins. So the hash table implementation is going to be exactly the same for both two systems, linear probing. All right? And then the hash join algorithm will be essentially the same. The difference, though, is going to be the hash function. So in the case of vectorwise, they're going to want to use murmur2 because that can be vectorized uh, and it's going to execute, uh, I think, double the number of instructions as the, as, as the other approach. Sorry, it's going to be vectorized even though it's going to execute, use more instructions than CRC32. Right? So what Hyper does is they run CRC32, which I think is, there's an instruction to do this in, in x86. So they'll run this twice, get two 32-bit hashes, and then combine them together and turn, turn it into a 64-bit hash. Right? And so this is going to be way cheaper than this, but because this can be vectorized, uh, this will have better throughput for the way the way vectorwise wants to execute things, right? So again, so, so like the, the, the nitty-gritty details don't exactly matter. I'm just trying to say that like there are things that are going to have to be slightly different, but, but like these are, uh, I don't want to use the word intrinsic because it implies SIMD, but like these are inherent to the actual implementation of the system that you would have to do it this way. You'd want to do it this way. So you can't have everything be exactly the same. There are things you're going to want to do differently. So the two implementations will be uh, tectorwise and typer. I'm going to slip up and probably say vectorwise and hyper. Uh, <laughs> anybody know why they're called tectorwise and typer? The first author in the paper is named Timo. He named it after himself, right? He's the student that did all the work, right? Uh, but he had, like, he had the vectorwise. I mean, I, I'm a co-author in this paper. I was happy to help. Uh, but the, uh, you know, Peter Bons, the guy who co-authored the paper, he's the guy that, that built Vectorwise with Marcin that did, did Snowflake. Um, and then Hi Thomas Neumann built, uh, built Hyper. So it's, it wasn't like they read the papers and tried to figure out how to do certain things. Uh, you know, they asked the authors, how should, they, how should they implement both of these things? So this is, in my opinion, this is the best comparison of these two approaches. Again, I'm not saying this because I'm an author in the paper, because it really is like they asked the source, how do you do this? Right, and Timo was a, was a PG student at, at, at Munich, so he saw, he could see the hypercode anyway. All right, so, so with vectorwise, so they're going to break operations into the pre-compiled primitives that we talked about before. Um, and then the, the one key difference also is going to be that each of the primitives are going to need to materialize the output uh, of, of the, whatever the evaluation they're doing, these offsets, sort of that into a buffer, and then hand that to the next primitive. In the case of hyper, because they're doing these, trying to do these tight loops on a, operating on a single tuple at a time, they don't have to materialize any, any offsets because the tuple is just going to be there, right? And then, and then the, the, the for loop stops and you go back to the next iteration. Like you, you break out of it, or not break out, you continue and go back and restart the next iteration once whatever predicate or whatever you're trying to compare against uh, doesn't satisfy you know, the, the, the query anymore and you, you just discard it. You don't need to store it anywhere in a buffer, right? 
So this will come up when we talk about the results. Like, there will be some cases that uh, this, this materialization cost will be more expensive, but in other cases, uh, the, the benefit you get through vectorization will, will outweigh the, the benefit you get from the, these tight loops. All right, so the comparison they're going to use, so the, system, the, the workload they're going to use for this is a subset of TPCH. So TPCH is showing up in a lot of these, the papers you guys are reading, right? Because this is the, this is the standard benchmark that people uh, use to evaluate uh, uh, OLAP systems. Um, it's an older benchmark. It's from the 1990s. There's a newer one called, called TPCDS. TPCH is like 22 queries uh, and I forget how many tables. It, but then uh, TPCDS, there's more tables, but it's like 100 queries. And they're like, they do CTEs are more complicated. But TPCH is sort of the, the if you say you have an OLAP, OLAP system, TPCH is the bare minimum you need, you need to support because you, you can do analytics, right? So instead of running all 22, instead they're going to choose five. And it's not chosen at random. It's based on this paper that Thomas and Peter Bontz wrote in a, a few years ago where they actually did a low-level analysis of TPCH running in a real system to identify what are the different pain points in the bottlenecks, like what are the key aspects of TPCH queries that matter when you build a modern OLAP system. So the idea that these five queries are representative enough of the real workloads uh, that you would encounter in the real world as identified by the, the categorization done in, the, in a previous paper, right? So again, and the idea here is that because, not to trying to do a sweep of everything, we handpick which queries you want to run, and that, then we can focus on uh, and understand more deeply what's actually the, the, the problems or bottlenecks that these systems are, are hitting, right? So the first two queries, Q1 and Q6, these are going to be, uh, without joins, scans on the line item table, which is the largest table in TPCH. You can think of like the fact table in a, in a star schema. Um, and the first one, they're going to compute four aggregates, uh, but it's also going to do fixed point arithmetic, um, again, with the, the fixed point numerics. And then uh, Q6 is going to be very selective filters that are going to be uh, cheap to compute. Um, I think there might be one numeric end, but it's like, it's like integer evaluation, like you're comparing two integers. Q3 and Q9 are both going to be the joins. Uh, the difference is going to be the, uh, the size of, of the, the hash table and the size of the, the, the data set they're probing on the, the, the two sides of the join. So Q3 is going to have a smaller hash table uh, on the build side, but it'll probe more tuples. Q9 will have a larger hash table, sorry, smaller hash table, sorry, larger hash table, but smaller, fewer tuples you want to, you want to probe. Um, and then the last one is going to be Q18. It's going to be a uh, group by with a uh, super high cardinality, uh, like, like 1.5 million groups, which, which, which is a lot. So it'd be a pretty huge hash table to, to build that out. So again, I don't know if you guys ever looked at, we'll see what TPCH queries look like. Uh, we have our, uh, our own benchmark framework called Benchbase here at CMU, uh, and this links in the, um, in the slides. But you, this is Java code. You can see what the template in TPCH Guru is if you, if you want to, ever want to see what it looks like. Right? And for, for your final project, Project 3, if you need to run TPCH, use this. Right? And thanks to Lee Chen for making it so the, uh, the, the Benchbase now does supports generating the tables you know, for you in Java. It used to be you have to run the dbgen code, which is the C, generate a bunch of CSV files, and then load that in through Benchbase. Leachai makes it so everything loads all at once. So thank you. OK. So let's, in the first graph here, we're going to look at uh, single threaded performance uh, of, of the two systems for across these different queries. Um, and the, they'll be measuring in terms of runtime in milliseconds, because it's, it's a scale factor 1 in TPCH means it's a 1 gigabyte database. So it's not, it's not massive. Um, but again, we're just trying to get down to understanding the, the core differences of these of the approaches. So the first thing we see that in because Q, Q1 and Q18, Hyper does better. Um, but for Q6, 3, and 9, VectorWise does better, right? What's wrong? You're already messing up. You said Hyper and VectorWise. Oh, OK, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, right, so in this case here, for Q1 and Q18, or sorry, for Q1 and, 18, Q1, Q1 and Q18, Hyper's doing better for the aggregations, but for 6, 3, and 9, uh, VectorWise is doing better for the filters and, and the joins. All right, does the graph tell us anything? Not really, right? Because, I mean, the performance numbers are, like, are nice. You can see a difference, but it doesn't, doesn't explain why, right? And that's the thing we actually want to care about, right? So we, 
So to do this evaluation further, you now need to dig into the uh, at sort of the CPU level with the hardware counters. What's actually going on here? Why why are we seeing a difference in performance? All right. So QC is almost the same. Yeah, QC. Yeah, there's. Yeah, so 15 milliseconds versus 60 milliseconds. It's so. It, yeah, it's almost the same. But again, you know, you look at like Q18. That's a pretty big difference. Uh, Q9 is a pr pretty big difference, right? Your question is like for for like, do we t for an, our analysis we want to look at the ones where there is a big gap. Yeah, yeah we'll get there. It's next slide. Yes, All right. Does everyone know what a harbor counter is? Who here doesn't? Is this some random string inside CPU that like tells the counter something like point general how many drives you have? How many Yeah. So you ever hear that? So in in modern CPUs, there's these registers down that that you can get access to. Sometimes you need to have privileged access. Sometimes uh, you can make a syscall to get it. Um, but if, if you run perf or vtune, you can they'll expose these, these things. But basically, the CPU is going to maintain these counters for your program as it's running. And then you can run something like perf. Uh, and it has almost zero overhead to the program while it's running. And then it dumps out this, this, this perf file that you can then analyze and look at all these counters. So you can run your database, run your system. Or, or, you can run out other applications, but who cares? We care about databases. Like you run your database system, you run these these you know these workload, you you collect these performance counters, then you can go back and understand like what is you know what's the load level team, what did the CPU actually do? Um, it's quite impressive. Uh, there's again VTune is like the GUI, uh, the graphical interface that Intel gives you, and then Perf is the open source like command line one in Linux. Uh, I th they I think they collect the same thing. VTune is, makes prettier pictures. Um, Anyway, so in our table here, all these things on this side here, these are going to be the hardware the performance counters. But we're going to normalize them based on the number of tuples that the, 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 the query has processed. Right? Because otherwise, it's just arbitrary large numbers, and it's, it does, they're meaningless. right? And then for this column here, this is, this is just the reiteration of the, or the repeat of the thing I showed in the last slide here. Right? Here's the, the, the runtime performance uh, when you actually run the queries. His question is, does the runtime include the compilation time of, of, of type or no? No. Because no. that will just dominate things, right? For, for sort of scale, for scale factor one, right, the query is running 15 milliseconds. Like, it's, it's not worth it. Again, OLAP, again, assume you could do, like, the Redshift thing where things are already pre-compiled for you and, and just, you just reuse it. OK, so here's the runtime in milliseconds. And as we go along to, make, to understand which one's actually better, like I'll just use the shading here. So if the row is shaded, it means that was the faster one for, the, for these queries in these different groups. OK? All right, so let's start with the, the, the first case where uh, Hyper was doing better, or Typer was doing better, right? Q1 and Q18 here. So if we go look at this column here, the number of instructions, uh, you can see that the, the vector wise is executing almost double the number of instructions as. Uh, as, as hyper, right? So in this case here, lower is better because fewer instructions, that's good, right? So, so again, so that, that's, so this, you know, we attribute this why it's going better. Um, we can also see this in terms of the, uh, well, actually, you know, what's interesting though is like the number, it's executing more instructions, but the number of instructions per cycle for vector wise is actually much higher uh, than, than, than hyper for the bottom one here and for the top one. So even though vector wise is executing double the number of instructions, it's getting uh, maybe fifty percent more instructions per cycle, so it's not a uh, it's it's executing more instructions, but it's more efficient on, on those instructions that it is executing um, because it's uh, because it's, it's it's avoiding cache stalls, right? Um, and it, actually, here yeah, the, the kernels are tighter. There's fewer branch. Uh, in this case here, it's branch misses. That, that's what's saving them. So. The, 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 the for loops are tighter. They can, they can execute. They have to do more work because they have to materialize the output. Uh, they're more efficient in the, the, the instructions that they're doing. But just because Hyper is just, it's just way more, it's doing way fewer things, uh, it's, getting, it's getting the better results. Right? So in the, uh, in the top case here for Q1, the, the the aggregation is sort of what is what the main thing that's, that's, that's uh, causing it to be more expensive here. 
um, you know, pop, pop it in the hash table and so forth. All right, so again, in this case here, uh, fewer instructions was better, um, and that, that, out, that outweighed the benefit you get from uh, a, a better instruction, uh, instruction per cycle count. But in this case here, uh, for Q3 with the join, the, the hyper is, is executing uh, fewer instructions. We're still seeing that benefit of, of the better instruction per cycle count in vector-wise, but vector-wise is actually still doing better here. Right? It's close, but it's still better. So this is saying that now we can't just look at the total instruction count per tuple or the instructions per cycle. We have to look at other metrics, or other performance counters, and understand what's actually going on. So in this case here, it's actually the, the branch misses is what's killing hyper and making vector-wise uh, run faster. Right? Because the, they're all joins. Um, so in the case of, uh, of vector-wise, you are, like, there's not really any benefit you're getting for, sorry, in the case of vector-wise, the likelihood that you're going to bounce out of the, of the for loop and go back and get more tuples is, is rather low. Um, so therefore, in the case of hyper, like on a single tuple basis, you know, whether there's a predicate match or that finds a match in the hash table, it'll, it's kind of, it's random, so it'll bounce out. In the case of, uh, in the case of vector-wise, for each sort of batch of tuples it's looking at, there is some work that's going to, that's going to, there's some tuples that are going to qualify. You are going to get some benefit from it. So you are going to produce some useful results, even though for not all the tuples in, in your lane. Right? So you keep planning forward. There's less branch misprediction because there's, there's just less branching. Right? So now in this case here, Q9, the other join, same thing. Uh, hyper is getting lower instructions, uh, but worse instructions per cycle. But then the, the branch misses are basically the same, though. And actually, vector-wise is actually a little even, even worse, right? But even then, it's, it's still faster, and actually by quite a lot. So the thing we care about now is actually cycles, right? So because uh, even though, again, the vector-wise has a higher branch misprediction, the, the amount of stalls that it, that it has is just going to be much, much fewer because the, in this query here, the hash table is larger. The probe side is smaller than, than in Q3. So the cost of doing those, uh, the hash probes, there's fewer of them. Because I can batch these things up in vector-wise, I can just do more work. In the case of hyper, again, single tuple at a time doing the probe, that, that becomes expensive. Because you can't, uh, with the hash probes, because it's looking to random locations in memory, the CPU can't speculate execute ahead or look ahead and try to figure out what, what's going to execute. right? So the, the way to think, and think about it is, in the case here, the probe loop is more expensive, uh, and, and you, you just end up just doing more stuff and more stalls. Sorry, the same, fewer instructions, but more stalls because you're doing random lookups in memory. Whereas in, uh, in vector-wise, again, you, you can amortize that out. Right? Again, so I don't really know the right way to, to convey this information other than like going at looking at these raw numbers uh, bit by bit, because I don't think a graph would actually help. But it's good to sort of see all these numbers in context, understand what the queries are doing and why we see, uh, you know, why we see one perform better than another. And it isn't just like, OK, I'm executing fewer instructions, or I have better instructions per cycle. It's, it's a combination of these things. OK, so the main takeaway from that previous table is that the, the, both the implementations, both the system architectures, are going to be efficient and achieve roughly the same performance. In some cases, it'll be better in certain some scenarios, other cases, the other, other one will be, will be better. And in the parts where they are, um, where one clearly outperforms the other, the relative numbers can be seen quite significant. But if you think of the sort of absolute numbers, it's actually not that much. Right? So just going back to the, uh, to the, t to the, the graph view, right? So he pointed out Q6, it's a, it's a one millisecond difference between these. But even for the one that has the largest gap, like Q8, Q, Q18, like we're talking you know, 50 milliseconds. Uh, and so the, on the relative terms, that seems like a lot. But when you compare it against like Postgres or a traditional row-based system, right, those, they, these, you know, these two approaches are still going to be 100x faster, or two orders of magnitude faster than what a row-based system is going to do. That's not doing you know, either vectorization or, or compilation. So I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds about, OK, like, Yes, it's, it's faster, uh, 
by like you know one, one third or so forth. When you compare it against how else uh, how existing systems were implemented before these techniques came along, it's uh, it's it's clearly better, and it doesn't actually matter make me matter that much which, which which one you choose. Um, in the case of the the, the hyper approach, it's going to be better for, for the calculation heavy queries with few cache misses. So again, the we have the for loop that's iterating over a single tuple, but the amount of work you do per iteration of the tuple, if that is computationally expensive, the keeping everything in your CPU register and just operating on that one tuple at a time is going to be better before you know going back, instead of using b batches, right? And the vectorization approach would be better for hiding uh, the cache miss latencies. So when I, uh, if there's a, if I had to go get a bunch of data in different locations uh, and I'm going to pay a cache miss penalty for that, at least when I bring that, 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 when I pay that penalty, I'm, I'm going to do a lot, you know, I'm going to pro process a lot of tuples all at once. So for every cache miss, I can process maybe, you know, like 100 tuples instead of one cache miss per tuple. All right, and that's going to matter for when you're doing hash joins and the, and the builds and the probes. So again, also too, I was saying like this is, the study is interesting. And again, if you're building a new system, I think this is the, this is a roadmap to say what design choices you can make. The, again, when you start measuring cycles though, or in low level operations, it becomes almost like, just like, like frustratingly, uh, like you're dealing with a minutia maybe you don't care about. So my one PhD student, Brashant, after he did the relaxed operator fusion paper, he started looking at how to try to optimize in-memory hash joins. And I think the state-of-the-art approach at the time was doing 12 cycles per tuple, and he got it down to 11. And that was like, that was after six months. Uh, it was very impressive what he did, but we just realized that like, that's not a paper you could write, or that's not really like groundbreaking research because you shaved a cycle, right? It's, it's like we're getting down to the bone here of how fast these systems are and these implementations are, but there's not much left to optimize. And it's the higher level stuff like query optimizers and so forth that I think are more, more relevant. Is it, that's just my opinion. Okay. All right, so now what we want to do is the, again, there was a bunch of other studies in the paper you know, comparing against like Knight's Landing, comparing against the, the different Harvard architectures and so forth. Um, the other part of the paper I want to focus on is when they evaluate how much SIMD actually helps. So recall when we talked about uh, in when we talked about vectorization uh, two classes ago. You know, there was there were some comparisons between the uh, you know between the vectorized and, and the scalar version. Um, but again, now if you start looking at, okay, if you want to understand, okay, if I compare against the compilation stuff, I want to know how much is SIMD actually helping us like in the case of where well, vectorized is better. Again, within a single test bed. I think when I show results, I was comparing, uh, for the compilation stuff, I was comparing like the haiku stuff, which not doing vectorization, but I was comparing like different systems from different experiments that had a, you know, different things that could cause them to be one perform better than another. Now within a single test bed, test bed we can understand how much is SIMD actually gonna, gonna make things better for us. So for this one, we're going to use the, the vectorized branch search selection that we talked about before and hash probe and vectorized. And we're going to try to uh, use AVX 512 as much as possible because as we said previously that in that new iteration of SIMD from, from Intel, they had new instructions or they had new features that allow us to do, uh, to pass bit masks into our SIMD instructions to do selective evaluation of, of tuples. And what matters before is that AVX2, you could do the same thing, but you, the bit mass would have to be stored in the full CMD register. Now these are specialized register, registers that are just for bit, bit masks. All right. So we're going to, again, we're, we're going to look at the, uh, for this one, we're going to use only for vectorwise, and we'll use the pre-compiled pre primitives. And we've got to see whether if we toggle on vectorization for these, for these primitives, how much is actually going to help us, to help us to explain why we think, in some cases, is vectorwise doing better than hyper. So for this one, uh, we're going to look at, I think, just, uh, one query. We'll take Q3 and Q9, that what we're doing the joins. And we're going to break it down to the different primitives, so the hashing, the gather, and then the, 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 the actual join process here. Again, the gray bar is going to be the scalar implementation, and then the, the, the red bar will be with SIMD. So in this case here, again, if you just look at like, the micro benchmark of just the primitive running on, on a single, uh, single thread, um, and again, scale factor one, in this case here, everything's going to fit in the CPU cache. You get a pretty significant improvements, right? You don't get the 100x stuff or the 4x stuff that we talked about before. But just for hashing, you know, 2.3x is, is, is pretty significant. Again, for this primitive, we're going to execute a lot. 
gather is a little less, and then the join itself is, is 1.4, right? Because the problem, as I said, like if you look at the primitives by themselves, uh, you know, in some cases, they're, they're just discarding the output. I, I hash my tuple and then immediately like throw it away. But in a real system, because I have to like materialize the output and chain it up the query plan, uh, I may, you know, I'm not always going to get this benefit. So if you now look at like the end-to-end -end query execution for three, three and nine, with the SIMD, you're only going to 1.1x improvement because it's that materialization cost. Because it's the, it's, uh, you know, you're not you're not just hashing things over and over again, right? You're trying to pass things along up the query plan. And th those are sort of, sort of incidental costs end up being the bulk of the, of, the, of the time being spent in the query, not just like running gather or hashing, All right? So in this case here, the, the SIMD is helping us in, in the vector-wise numbers that I showed before, but it's not the main reason, right? It's the, it's, it's the way sort of, the, again, it's moving tuples in these loops, in batches, uh, through these pre-compiled primitives and understanding, you know, uh, and how like, how that data is moving along and trying to, you know, trying to avoid uh, long stalls for caches or cache misses. All right. So the next thing they did is is uh, try to understand how well can the compiler automatically aut automate the the vectorization of these vectorized primitives. So in the original vectorized implementation. Um, I don't know what's in there now, but this is what Peter told me what they built originally. They didn't write any with anything with intrinsics. They just they just wrote stuff that hoped the compiler could figure it out. Um, and so what we did is we went back and tried a bunch of different compilers, uh, and we were going to take these these different primitives. And in some cases, we were write explicit with uh, you know code with intrinsics, but then we'll recompile it without those intrinsics and see how well the, the compiler can can figure it out for us. Right. And they want to see, again, focusing on AVX 512, they want to see how well the compiler can, can do this for us. So we'll look at three implementations. One will be with, uh, with only automatic vectorization. One will, will be with uh, uh, manual intrinsics. And then another one will be if we try to let the compiler auto vectorize everything. If it can't figure it out, then we, they go back and, and write explicit intrinsics for this. All right, so in this graph here, again, we have the uh, the same five queries we looked at before, right? And, and here now, what we're measuring is the, the reduction of the number of instructions that the CPU executes relative to a completely scalar implementation. So the idea is, again, we don't want to look at absolute values here because they'll be really large and don't mean anything. We want to know, like, for, uh, if we compare against the non-vectorized implementation of the system, how many, how many fewer instructions are we actually going to execute uh, for the vectorized approaches? So, you see that the, the auto vectorization does actually a pretty good job. In the cases where uh, it can't figure it out, we had to go back and manually add, add, add things. The main implementation, I forget why it's so much lower in this case here, um, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But like, it's, it's a combination of these two of these things. Like the red bar is you want to say, like, this is how you actually maybe want to re really build it. You let the compiler try to auto vectorize everything. And then if the places that it can't, you mainly go add bad, the, you know, based on the techniques we talked about before. I'll also say, too, I'm only showing the results here for, for Intel's compiler, ICC. Um, it did a much better job than Clang and GCC. This is like 2017, so maybe it's gotten better. Um, but ICC, Intel does a very good job uh, making the compiler do, do really well. But it, you know, it's not free. It costs money. Um, so that's why not everybody uses it. Right? All right, so, all right, so, so we, we executed fewer instructions. Is that going to always help us? Not really, right? So now if we compare against the, the relative performance of the vectorized implementations versus, the, again, the scalar implementation, uh, and, and this is percentage improvement. So if you're less than zero, it means, means you're actually running slower. Uh, you'll see in some cases, fantastic. When we vectorize, we, we do a great job. We get faster. Uh, and in some cases, it, it actually gets worse. Right? And so the, the main t first of all, the main takeaway from this is that you probably don't want to auto-vectorize uh, your primitives because, you know, because the binary is being shipped with that that, you know, with those compiled, compiled primitives, you might land on some hardware that is going to this could cause problems. I forget, the I don't remember at the time whether we actually measured whether we got the CPU downcycled us because we were executing AVX five twelve, and then for it, it reduced the clock speed and we paid a penalty for that. Uh, but it could just be us again the the cache misses and the stalls are trying to 
trying to put things into batches and put into registers, like that doesn't come for free. That is why you know things are getting 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 slower, right? So the cache misses are going to overwhelm any benefit you get from the, the parallelization through 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 SIMD, all right? So I think I might have mentioned this too. In the uh, there's a research paper from from Peter Bontz and the, the vectorized guys where they compile the primitives in like vectorized and non-vectorized form with different compilers, and then at runtime they, they would just measure. Okay, if I try this primitive. It, it, if I try these two primitives, which one's faster? It's the same primitive, like compare the integer column with an integer constant. Compare the two, which one is up faster? That's when you just reuse. So they can dynamically, at least in research, they can dynamically figure out whether they want to vectorize, use a vectorized version or not without having to recompile everything. All right, so this last graph here is a sort of, uh, you know, it's not real numbers, it's just showing you the design space that is possible for, uh, for, for, you know, for building a, a modern OLAP system. Um, and again, the, 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 the x-axis is operating on two at a time versus a vectorized approach, and the bottom approach is either through interpretation, uh, the interpretation meaning like the, you, would, you, know, you interpret a program, but then you can call pre-compiled primitives, which again, what system R was doing something like that. Um, the system R was basically doing this, vectorized is doing the same thing that the system R did back in the day, but they had pre-compiled pre primitives. And then you have the compilation approach. And, it's just sort of showing you that, this, they, that the, somehow the sweet spot is, is sort of in this range here. Um, again, this is from 2017. Umbra would be uh, you know, potentially over, up, up in here, the, the, best, the best place. And then noise page, when we had that, that was, that was over up here as well, because we do compilation and vectorization. Okay? So the main takeaway of this is, again, like, they're basically the same uh, in the end. Um, in terms of, terms of performance results, I think the vectorized approach, the vectorized approach is actually going to be easier to implement and easier to debug, debug and maintain over time from a software engineering point of view. Right? The, and, and most of the systems, most of the major OLAP systems are choosing to do vectorization, not compilation. BigQuery doesn't do compilation. Uh, as I said, the Databricks, they had it in, the, in, in, in Tungsten. They dropped it in, in, in Photon. Uh, Redshift does compilation, but they're, yeah, they're, you know, they're compiling the whole query. Um, I don't know what ClickHouse does compilation for, for where clauses. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit harsh, but most of the systems are doing vectorization. Okay? So I would say, in my opinion, if you're building a system from scratch, I would start with that, because you can get up and running more quickly than if you try to build a compiler. All right. So before we jump into the, the projects, uh, as I say, so next class, we'll then spend uh, three lectures on, on doing joins. So we'll do hash joins first, sort merge join next, and then uh, a new lecture th this year will be doing multi-way joins. Um, and very few systems implement this, but this is sort of what the, this is where I think this decade is going to go. A bunch of systems are now going to support multi-way joins because the performance benefits for, uh, for many scenarios is, is quite significant. And the, the, the DuckDB guys have a, have a branch that, ha, that had a support for it. OK? All right, so let's go through all these. Project two. So uh, for project two, uh, again, the goal is that you write a report about a, a real world database system. Um, and it's not like an academic, uh, it's not an academic formal paper, but rather a, uh, it's, it's sort of you synthesizing things we've covered in the class and looking at these real systems and understanding from the documentation or uh, any public information or potentially even talking to the developers, because we've done that in the past, to understand how these systems are actually implemented. And then we have a taxonomy to describe the uh, you know, for different sort of feature components, you know, what approaches are, are they using, right? So I'm going to post on Piazza, either today or tomorrow, uh, a, a link to a sign-up sheet uh, where I'll list a bunch of these systems. We'll do first come, first serve. You can sort of pick what system you want, because there's, there's a lot of them. Um, but I'm going to curate the list to be uh, cover systems where they are significant enough where there is enough information that describes what they're doing. Like, there's a lot of hobby projects where everyone rewrites Redis. Uh, we don't, we're, not, we're not covering those. Um, but instead, we're going to like, again, like look at the ones that are actually a full-fledged OLAP system. If there's one system you want to choose that, that, that I miss, one, tell me, because I'm surprised I would miss it. Um, 
but like there's systems that in previous years people have already written the articles. So we want we like for the again for Postgres one that one's pretty well written. We wouldn't we wouldn't want to pick that. So what we're going to do is there's there's two ways there's going to be two submission dates. The first one will be uh, a feedback submission where you say like here's the first draft that it April first, and I'll give you feedback and say what what's working not working. And then the final submission will be on May, May first. Again, there's a lot of systems, so we'll I'll help I'll help guide you. This is not even all of them. Uh, I'll help guide you which ones you want. So uh, you'll be writing this on DBDIO. It's my database of databases. So this is an encyclopedia that we actually partly wrote because of this class and the intro class where students would ask, like, oh, how does, you know, what system does multi-versioning this way? And I, I knew some of them. I didn't know all of them. The idea is that we want to have a, a sort of a, a taxonomy that we can evaluate and browse and look at to understand how these systems are actually the same. Right? Because if you look at like DB engines, they have the ranking thing that everyone always cites. But when you actually look at the description of the systems, it's like freeform text. It's not very, uh, it's not normalized. And then I think they allow people to pay money to update it, which I, I don't want to do. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you know, here's the website. There's, you know, we, we can categorize things. So like, here's all the systems that are derived from uh, from Postgres. Um, Mary Posa was, was the system that Mike built after. Uh, after Postgres, it was a distributed. It was a distributed version of Postgres when like peer to peer thing. Peer to peer was peer to peer systems were the hot thing in the in the nineties. So he built that. Anyway, and then there's an article like this where again for each of these different sections, there's a little text here you can you can write. Okay. So for both the feedback submission and the final submission, it has to be all your entirely your own writing. Uh, I actually don't care if you use ChatGPT and then go fix it up, make sure it actually works. Right. <laughs> and this is the modern era. Right. Like who cares. But like you obviously need to like make sure what ChatGPT is saying is correct, um, and I suspect that it's probably trained on on, on us. So for, for newer systems, I don't think it's going to be able to figure it out. But we'll, we'll see. Anyway, so both the submissions for the feedback and then the and the final one have to be your own writing. Again, don't copy and paste from random <laughs> internet. Um, again, I don't care. It's ChatGPT. Tell me, and, and let's look at it together. Okay? No, just, why not? All right. Any questions about about Project Two? You want to write an article for bus tub? Uh, let's, let's take that one offline. <laughs> well, you keep asking me for a password to update other things. We, we, can, we can do that. Um, all right, cool. I think I, I met you before you came to CMU because I emailed you and said, do you have the logo for, for Rising Light? Yeah. yeah, so anyway. All right, so that's project two. Project three. Uh, oh, the, no. That one was hard. I couldn't, I couldn't get that one to work right. Um, all right, so this is going to be a group project with, with Two or three uh, uh, teammates in the class, and the idea is that we want to do build some significant amount of code or some system implementation that ideally covers the things that we're going to talk about in this class, um, or talk, we're talking about in this class. But it could also be something if you're in your own research or something you're just interested in trying out, uh, then you know I'm, I'm up for that as well. So this is not live yet, but I'll post information on the on Piazza. There'll be a another spreadsheet. It'll be, the same, it'll be the same spreadsheet for, all, for Project 2, Project 3, but there'll be another sheet within that file that you can go put your name in for, for the, the, the groups you want to be in. And if you can't find a teammate, there's a way to put your list there. You put your name in a little part, and we'll, we'll figure out how to put people together. Okay? So the, the deliverable is going to be for, for next Wednesday in class will be a five-minute presentation about what your project is going to be about. Um, again, this is just forcing you to think about what, what it actually is you want to do. Then it'll be a status update presentation in the first week of April. Again, this is just showing you, like, instead of you, you're saying, I'm going to do this in March and then disappear, you're not, not doing it for two months and then trying to do, you know, one week before it's due, try to do something. It's a forcing function again for you to, to show to the class what you've done. And then the final design document and the final presentation will be done uh, when, whenever we have our final exam. And so I went, one thing that sucks, again, also not building a system at CMU, another aspect of this project, we used to do code reviews. Because that's actually a really important like, aspect of going out to the real world and doing system development. You have to look at other people's PRs. Uh, and again, because <laughs> what's that? Bus yeah. <laughs> sure. Yes. But but I'm saying like like in, like it's actually a, it's a good soft skill. There isn't a class on how to do PRs reviews. Uh, and so we used to do that in this class. Unfortunately, we can't. 445 to learn how to review. Sure. PR. Yes. Um, Anyway, I mean, you've got you, you've worked at real Davis companies. I'm not crazy, right? The people, are, like, this is not people aren't committing to to, to Maine. You're not crazy. Yeah. So, anyway, it's like we can't do that because everyone's working on different code bases. But 
it might be something we, we can try to figure out how to do uh, as we go along. Okay. All right, so the, the, the presentation will, the, next week will be just five minutes about the high level, what you want to do. So obviously, you would have to have a topic. Uh, again, I'm, I'm happy to chat either this weekend or early next week if, if you're not sure, come to office hours. Um, and then you can describe like, what you're actually going to build, how you're actually going to you know, build it. Right? If you can say, I'm going you know, to modify Oracle, well, that's not going to work because Oracle's, you know, <laughs> Oracle is closed source and it takes. I think. I'm going to reverse engineer Oracle so I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't get sued. Uh, but also, it takes 24 hours to compile Oracle. <laughs> yeah. You, there's a Hacker News post about it. The guy's like, the way to test Oracle is like you write your code, and then you submit it to the build system, and it, and it takes 24 hours like, to can build, build it and run the test. And you basically you have to do other stuff, and you come back the next day and figure out what that crashed. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, I'll, we can show this afterwards. What's that? Because of all the tests, they have to. So when you compile the whole system, it might, it might take 24 hours. No, no, no. This is like build plus test is 24 hours, right? Because like for every like for, Oracle is like a 40, 50 year old system. So if, like every single like corner case, if some customer had a bug, there's a test case for that. The test case is the time consuming. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's a big. I don't know how long it's going to take to compile too. It's not going to be. Yeah. It's not going to be instantaneous. No, no. It's, yeah, not 24 hours. It's, it's, it's the test. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so how are you going to test on that note? How are you going to test whether your implementation is correct? Uh, this is actually, again, I think you guys are, I'm noticing the amount of soft skills, of the, of the sophistication of the soft skills of the students uh, in this class have, has gotten better over years. Uh, so like, you guys are the same age as previous students. You just come in like, oh, I know what a PR is. Or like, oh, I know how to write a test case in, in just printing the standard out, right? Like, you'd be surprised. In, in previous years, like, that's how people wrote tests. Um, all right, and then uh, what workloads you would use for the project? Again, we have Benchbase. It'll have TPCH that you could, you could use, OK? Status update is just, again, saying, like, OK, what, is, what if anything, has changed uh, in your plan? Uh, and then you know, where you're at in, in, in the project. And then a demo, early demo of something would be, would be super cool as well, but it's not required. The design document will be at the end of the semester. Again, uh, actually, this is part of the status update. Let's, should be end of the semester. Uh, we'll be just like, here's the thing that I actually built. And the reason why I, I asked you guys to do this, because it's one thing to write a bunch of code, but another thing to like, put it in writing. I'm, not, like, I'm looking for like, a page, not like a whole thesis. Like, put it down in writing, explain what it is you actually implemented. Um, and then what we also do is, we, on the course website, what we'll do like a showcase. Here's all the projects everyone did with your slides and the link to the source code. And it's useful for two reasons. One is the companies see what you did, and they can hire you based on that. Uh, I had companies reach out to me afterwards, like, hey, this person did this. We need this in our system. Can you, can you connect me to them? We want to hire them. Um, and then for, for the international students, you guys are going to email me in, in two or three years and say, you need a letter for H1B or whatever. And I look at that thing, and, OK, this person worked on those things. And I can write that in, in the letter. So it's win-win it's for everyone. All right, final presentation. That'll be, again, whenever our final exam is. Uh, and then the idea is, again, we want to do some benchmark numbers, understand your implementation, what, what you're actually doing. And for this one, I, best case scenario, yes, you should, you should have demos or something. right? All right, so I'm going to go for four quick projects of things that we could potentially work on. Uh, I mean, Abby and Yuchen and Chi already have a project. Lee Chen already has a project. Same order. There are some projects that already exist, uh, but I'm going to talk about ones where we don't really have people right now working on stuff. So the first one is the, uh, what's that? The Germans. Yeah, the Germans. <laughs> anyway, I, I've been, so, I have, so in spring break, I have to go see the Germans. Uh, I've, I've been summoned. Um, what's that? Networking. No, they want to know. They, I gotta, they want to know why we're not building a system. I got to go see them. Um, anyway, so when I say the Germans, I, I, for this case here, for this project, I supposed to mean Thomas Neumann. So he he kept making this claim that the way the hyper did numerics was super efficient, uh, way better than anything else, and it, and that uh, nobody else did it the way he did it. And that it was easy to do, which I he said that about a bunch, bunch of things, and I, it's, I know not, not not the case. Um, so what he claimed was that uh, in this book called Hacker's Delight, uh, it was there's an interesting book. It's not something you just like read casually, but there's like a bunch of like bit shifting operations or games you can, tricks you can do to do fast uh, floating point arithmetic or floating point operations. Theta lab. What's that? Theta lab. 
less. Yeah, more or less, yeah. And so uh, I had a, somebody who took 720 before, they, we built this thing called lib fixy pointy. Um, this is actually written in noise page, but we extract it out and put it into, uh, as a standalone library. And it's based on uh, some inscrutable you know, techniques out, out of this book. Again, all, like, basically Thomas said, is like, oh yeah, it's this book, it's this chapter, you know, that tells you how to do everything. Not true, we took a while. But anyway, we have an implementation of it. I don't know how far along it is. I don't know how correct it is. Um, but ideally, I, I want to be able to finish this project and then implement it as a Postgres UDT, user-defined type. And then we can benchmark it against how, how fast our library is against uh, what Postgres can do. Um, and then we can potentially try to vectorize it again in the standalone library, not inside Postgres, and try to you know, maybe speed things up that way. So it's basically, you would have to learn a lot, like a lot of bit shifting stuff to make this actually work. Um, and the student that implemented this, he's at Oracle now. Um, and he's still on the CMU database group Slack channel. You, you can ask him questions. <laughs> well, it's Rohan, yeah. All right. So the next project is to do, uh, build a, a, a try to sell. What's that? <laughs> well, I, 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 no, I, I know how to, like, you know, get people's attention, right? Like, <laughs> All right, so we've been looking at, for, what, for, for a couple of years now, or since last year, uh, we've been looking at how to try to accelerate Postgres proxies. So Postgres networking is actually terrible, um, like the networking imp implementation itself, because of, it's just really inefficient. And we'll read a paper uh, from the Dr. B guys in, after the spring break that shows that, like, again, it's, it's just not the, the protocol itself and also the implementation is pretty, um, is not ideal. Uh, and so the way most people run, a lot of people run Postgres databases in production is actually put a proxy in front of it. PG Bouncer is probably the most popular one. Uh, there's RDS proxy for Amazon. Basically, it's like think of it as like a little little system that query requests go in and you immediately send it off to a, a you know to Postgres. But you can pull the connection. So instead of like spawning a whole process per every, every connection, you can have one you know uh, multiple connections point to a single uh, multiple connections in the proxy can point to a single connection in, in Postgres. So you, re you reduce the overhead of, of Postgres maintaining this. So we have an implementation of, of PG Bouncer where we use BPF to do uh, user space bypass. Does everyone know what BPF is? Who, who doesn't know? So BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. The E stands for, uh, for extended. Basically, it was, it's a way to write kernel modules in a dialect that I think is in, like C dialect that then gets verified and can run and basically with a VM inside the, data, inside of the, the kernel. So you, can, you, you can't do everything, but you can do things that would be, normally if you write it like a C kernel module, like it's, it's again, it's uh, random C code, you can break things. So the BPF, the idea is like, it's a restricted, uh, restricted API of what you can do, and they verify that you can't, like, that you're not malloking down in the kernel and breaking things. So we have a version of PG Bouncer that, that where he implemented the like, forwarding, uh, forwarding, uh, methods or, or, or procedures in, in the actual kernel itself. So query request shows up as a packet. Instead of going to the kernel, copying it into user space, processing it, and then sending it back down, it goes in the kernel, look at what it is, and immediately send it back out without having to go to user space. Why is this needed with Rust code? Well, okay, so we, we, we have implemented it with BPF in, in PG Bouncer, which is written in C. We, need, we want to apply this technique. And so PG Bouncer is also single process, single threaded. PGCAT is a newer, uh, a newer proxy that's written in Rust where that is getting popularity. And we want to try to apply our BPF same technique to, to this. No, so you, you, don't write the, you don't write the kernel modules in Rust. You write it in BPF. The, the Rust stuff then calls, no, sorry, the BPF stuff, stuff calls up to, to the Rust land, to, to the user space. If needed, the idea is you do much of the processing you can down, but the idea is that you have to then get the modified, huh? It, you, correct, yes. But if you um, like, we can talk about fine. If there's like state you have to maintain between both of them, you got to read up to it and get it back. So the the other one, the other sort of PG Bouncer is the most common one. The best implementation of a Postgres proxy right now is Odyssey out of Yandex out of Russia. What they do is insane. So they do, uh, they, they wrote their own coroutines. Uh, I think it's in C or C++. And they, uh, they write assembly to munge like, things in memory 
when you do context switch from one thread to another. It's very impressive what they do, but like modifying this to use um, to use PPF, like that sounds like a nightmare because they do a bunch of stuff that like is not necessary. PGCAT it would be the best the best one that we, we target. That would be multi-threaded. Uh, so user 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 bypass would be the first approach. Uh, if we have more time, we could do kernel bypass. So this is where network packet shows up. Instead of immediately going processing it into uh, in the kernel space and then copying into user space, you can have the network card write into this IOU ring, the ring buffer, and then user space can, can read from it. I don't know how much benefit we're actually going to get. I think you've, you've looked at it. It may not be a huge win in this case here because you still have to do some packet processing <laughs> and shove it back out. But at least we'd have a comparison. Now, we did try to do kernel bypass in uh, PG Bouncer using DBDK, which is the data plane data kit. Uh, at some point, I, I think somewhat off, I'll talk about SPDK and DBDK. These things are a nightmare. You don't want to do this. We tried. It didn't work. Uh, IOU ring is the modern incarnation of this, right? All right. So the 100% goal would be PGCAT uh, connection pooling with BPF. And then my PJ student, Matt, will have uh, benchmark scripts against Odyssey and PG Monster that you can run against. Again, and the Rust thing is just to be tantalizing for the crowd. All right, the, the next project is that we want to be able to do uh, some variation of adaptive query processing in, um, in Postgres. We'll talk a little bit about adaptive query optimization or, uh, at the end of the semester. But the basic idea is that while the query is running, if you recognize that the query plan you have is not the best query plan, like if the join order is wrong, then what you want to be able to do is maybe swap the order of things. Uh, there's obviously you have to deal with intermediate state or intermediate results. But you want to dynamically change the query plan uh, without having to go stop the query, go back to the optimizer, and run it again. That's how most systems actually do adaptive query optimization. Um, but we're interested in, like, can I do like fine grain without stopping the query, swap out plan nodes with something else? All right? And where the first version of this would just be, can we take a, a pipeline or portion of the query plan in Postgres, which is then just pointers to, uh, to other structs, other chunks of memory, can we swap that pointer out so that when it calls next, it goes to a different location that maybe returns fake data? So instead of having this giant query plan tree, where if I call next on some, some top level node and I go down and, and do a join, do all the scan and stuff like that, I need to immediately come back and say, oh yeah, here's your data. Right? So the, I can talk offline the use case for this, but like, it goes beyond adaptive query optimization. Uh, with with, the, with my, my PhD student, Wayne, is working on but like This would be work, sort of working with him in conjunction. Like, okay, can I, can I, can I modify the Postgres query plan on the fly without having to stop it? All right, the last project would be uh, doing UDF inlining. We'll cover this in lecture 14. But the basic idea is uh, you have a UDF written in a procedural language like PLBG SQL. Um, and the, the Microsoft technique can convert the, the, the UDF code into basically relational algebra and inject it into the query plan of the, of the query itself so that now when it does query optimization, it doesn't know, doesn't care that it used to be a function, but now it's inline as query plan nodes or, or relational algebra. And it can do a bunch of optimizations like dead code elimination and other, other things to speed things up. So we'll cover the Freud paper and other techniques in, in lecture 14. Uh, but Sam is interested in applying this technique to, to, to DuckDB. Um, and we're, the reason why we're choosing DuckDB instead of Postgres for this is because the Postgres query optimizer is way more primitive. It's, it's, it's more primitive than, than, than what DuckDB can do. The DuckDB one is based on what the Germans came up with. DuckDB was written by a German, but like, like a different German. Um, anyway, so, so the, the DuckDB optimizer has the things we need to, in order to support Microsoft Freud. So it'd be working with a different set of Germans uh, to potentially add this to support for DuckDB. OK? Again, I think some of you have already talked to Sam about this. All right, so how to get started. So I will post the, the, uh, the spreadsheet to sign up into groups on, on Piazza. So you meet with your team over the next couple of days, figure out a topic. If you're still stumping or want more clarification of the things that I've talked about here, send me an email, and we try to schedule time to meet. Um, and we obviously want to focus on open source things, so at least look at the source code. Obviously, don't get into the details. Uh, uh, don't, get, you know, don't try to get the low-level details and get hampered, like, oh, can I get it to compile? Worry about that later. Uh, but at least have an understanding of what it would take to actually implement the thing you're asking, asking to do. And for our Postgres stuff, we can provide some guidance for DuckDB 
uh, we'd have to go talk to them. And this is, I say during spring break, it's to be weekend. I'll, I'm around this weekend if you want to chat about something. OK? All right, any questions? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff, so y'all move 'cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Show. Here I come, Willie D. That's me. Rolling with Fifth Ward, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. Buy the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 bounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>